Hi there, and welcome to Valid of Vietnam. My name is James Scott of the Sacramento Public Library. Valid of Vietnam is a joint venture between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Veterans of America Chapter 500. It's our intent to trace the arc of experience of our local California Vietnam veterans as they went from California to Vietnam and then back again. Today's guest is Sergeant Ron Cossey. Ron spent uh, a tour of duty, uh, actually several tours of duty in Vietnam. There's one today that we're gonna focus on in particular um, from 67 to 68. He served with the uh, 34th Armored, uh, the Dreadnoughts, um, under the, uh, the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. Ron, welcome to Valley to Vietnam. Thank it's you very good much, to have James. You here, and of course, welcome home. Thank um, you, it's an honor to be here. Um, and it's an honor to have you here. We're, we're going to start out talking about kind of the essence of who you are um, from a very, very early age. And a lot of that relates to a yen to get out and do things. You, you use the term wanderlust, which is a, a first and foremost a German term uh, to get out, to wander, and to do it with passion. Um, tell us a little bit about that and how it's kind of been an engine to drive your your life. Oh my! Oh my! Uh, parents and family uh, are dust bowl people and just salt of the earth, just great people, hard workers. And uh, I was born and raised in Eureka, California, the lumber capital of the world at that time. And uh, very close, tight knit family. And uh, my mother. Uh, once we could start understanding what the words and stuff meant was she always was behind us and on whatever we wanted to do and for some reason at a very early age um, I had some tragedies happen and like most people do and uh, I just knew that I wanted to get out and experience life I wanted to uh, for lack of a better term just give it hell and and enjoy it and and uh, try to climb to the top of every mountain that I could and and uh, I very fortunate man that I I've done more than most and uh, I'm very comfortable with uh, with that yeah you had this really awesome bike set up all right um, yeah. tell me tell me a bit about that or tell us well, a bit about that well we, uh, all our people were uh, were uh, from that generation we were uh, World War II people, and uh, you know we were either cowboys and, or uh, or military people of some kind, and so we'd uh, get our bikes and spray paint them. And and uh, uh, on a particular mine, me and a friend of mine, we decided to put scabbards like uh, the old John Wayne movies with him on a horse and his Winchester rifle stuck in that scabbard and. Uh, we got together and made some little leather ones with our little plastic six guns on our side and riding our bicycles and then pull out our BB guns and uh, do a little target practice and stuff and uh, kind of John Wayne it up a little bit and, yeah. and just enjoy the freedom of growing up at that time in Eureka, California. Right. Yeah, the, the giant redwoods were our backyards and there were just oh, old cool. logging roads we could go on and uh, we, we camped out and, and made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and talked about uh, what we would do if we were in certain circumstances. And as I got older, I knew that I wanted to, uh, one thing I wanted to do was see the world and literally the world and go some places and do some stuff and not stay there. I, like most folks, graduated Friday and uh, like Monday morning, uh, I moved yeah. to Oakland, California, and waited till I was 18, and, and then joined the army. Uh. So you mentioned graduating on Friday, and then transitioning to Oakland, joining the army, and of course you you joined the army. Vietnam is is in play at this time. It's going on. You did your your basic at Fort Ord. You became a weapons specialist. Um, went overseas, not initially with tanks, but as a door gunner uh, in a gunship, um, and then eventually moved, in, moved on to uh, an M48 tank, M48, correct? M48, yeah, correct. 
Um, so it's, it's quite an odyssey. Uh, you know, you spent, what, a month or two? Yeah, about a month and a half or so. Uh, I was in Germany for about nine months, ten months, and then uh, some more training I wanted to take, and so then I took that, and then, then, then I volunteered to go to Viet <coughs> excuse me, Vietnam. And uh, I just, the helicopters were just uh, something very unique right. uh, at that time, and I'd talked to some guys at the armor school, and they were uh, door gunners with the first air cab, and 6,000 rounds a minute on a Vulcan minigun and a right. helicopter going through the air at 120 miles an hour. Right, right. You used the term rock and roll. Right. Uh, That's everything was lock and load, less rock and roll. Right. But your your time with with uh, helicopters is very short lived. Very short lived. They need you guys. They need a weapon specialist like you in armor. And plus, I had I had a it's called MOS, a military occupation specialty, and I had several of those and one of them was I did graduate from the armor school and uh, in an operation called Junction City One, uh, huge operation, uh, they lost a lot of tankers and they just kind of scoured Vietnam for anybody who was with a tanker's uh, specialty and I was one of them and I just went right down uh, to another unit that I, I wanted to spend some time on was the Big Red One, the 1st Infantry Division, one of the finest units and American military history, and uh, so I ended up with the uh, Bravo Company attached to the 1st Infantry Division as started out as a uh, tank gunner right. okay. with the 34th Armor. I want to step back a second, and um, you really eloquently during our pre-production talk um, talked about or contrasted the World War II experience with the Vietnam experience insofar is as far as what it's like to go into war either as an individual or as part of a unit. Um, can you talk a little bit about it? You know, everybody when I was growing up had uh, parents, uncles, neighbors uh, that were in the, uh, World War II in one way or another. And uh, in those days, they all went by troop transport, and uh, sometimes it'd take a couple weeks to get to Europe or couple weeks to get out on the South Pacific and stuff and it was usually very large groups of people, so a lot of them from the same hometown. Uh, that was a very good black and white war, very uh, the good war, evil versus good. Uh, when we went back to Vietnam, if you weren't in the initial units going over there, you were a replacement. Uh, so I knew when I was going over there as one person, I was going to replace one person. Whether that person was killed in action or made it home alive. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it was extremely lonely. I, I'm a, I remember getting on the plane and I didn't know a single soul. Mm -hmm. uh, and just kind of sat there and, and uh, uh, I was kind of thinking, you know, you volunteered for this, Ron. <laughs> Uh, which I consistently said throughout my time in Vietnam. Uh, I remember you volunteered for this, and uh, uh, and it, w it was completely different. I got off the airplane and I didn't know a single soul. And uh, as I said in my book, uh, there was a, a battle going on as, as I landed. I, I hadn't didn't actually have my feet on the ground. I was still on the game plank, and there was a battle going on. Let's move into move toward Tet. Okay. Um, your unit, the 34th, spends a lot of time on Highway 13, which is a main artery by which the uh, the NVA, the Viet Cong, are able to move items into the southern part portions of the country. Um, tell us a bit about your charge as a tanker on what was known as Thunder Road. Highway 13, as, as James has said, it was a main supply route. And one of the reasons they used it is, is uh, uh, a lot of South Vietnamese trucks and, and, and traffic and stuff was on them. They could co-mingle with that and uh, bring supplies down south literally in a big truck and just be tons and tons of stuff. And we did a lot of recon and a lot of intel work and stuff. And, uh, we just decided we'd shut the whole entire road down and we would take it and build bases alongside of it and, and it would never belong to the South Vietnam, North Vietnamese again. 
or the Viet Cong, and uh, it was a, a long, uh, battle-weary effort to uh, take it, and we took it. Uh, one of the things that we would do was uh, we'd make what, that's hence the name Thunder Road, tanks would go like at two or three o'clock in the morning. And we'd take four or five tanks and we'd run it up and down the road as fast as we could go, firing every weapon we had until it either hit a mine and blew up and we moved it off the side and kept going and that's how we cleared road. Or till we got return fire. And when we get return fire, we would there be a battle, and we'd call in airstrikes and mm -hmm. artillery, and the, we'd take another section of the road. Right. right. And then an uh, infantry company or, or wh whoever would hold that, and then we would move forward and leapfrog. And uh, the tanks were just kind of guinea pigs to blow up things. Right. And it's an odd feeling going down the road and just knowing that the only reason you're doing it is to hit a mine, to blow up. So the people coming behind you won't hit that mine. And Probably the largest flashpoint in your experience there. You spent 91 days, uh, and this is around Tet. 89 of those days were with contact, uh, Enemy contact. Enemy rather. contact. Um, now, one of the things you, you had to do um, during this time, you know, we've, in many of our other episodes, we've talked at length about the amazing network of tunnels um, sort of uh, sort of you know pocking South Vietnam um, when you found a tunnel uh, you could call someone in a special unit to go ahead and secure the area see what's inside but you didn't always have that luxury to have specialists come in there was one such occasion where you <coughs> indeed had to take on the moniker of tu Tunnel Rat yourself. Um, tell us a bit about th that experience of going underground. Uh, they were fighting the Japanese and they started building these tunnels in this triple canopy jungle to, to fight the Japanese. Uh, that was in the mid-1930s, uh, late 1930s, and they continued to build those uh, when the French were there after World War II when they were fighting the French. So they had an elaborate maze of tunnels that were extremely hard to find sometimes and when you did find them uh, number one the enemy was in there maybe mm -hmm. uh, there were supplies in there uh, maybe uh, weapons uh, maps uh, so if you found one you could not just ignore it uh, or it would come back to haunt you later mm -hmm. they would come out of there so uh, you threw a couple hand grenades down in there. You went in down there with a Model 11 Colt 45 and a knife. Mm -hmm. uh, they were made uh, for small people. I happened to be six foot two, and so it was uh, a little bit of a struggle for me. But I didn't think about it a whole lot because I was scared to death. <laughs> and uh, so you went in there and you ferreted it out. If there was the Viet Cong in there or North Vietnamese, you uh, killed them. Uh, be it by uh, that 45 or with a knife or whatever you need to do it and uh, also there was just some horrible they were just brilliant at booby traps uh, I think they could probably teach the uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan a thing or two about uh, booby traps and uh, they were just brilliant at doing them and uh, you knew that they were there and it was just the idea everything from punji steaks to uh, thing they, they call a bamboo viper that they, they would put in uh, uh, bamboo t tubes and you would hit a tripwire and all these hundreds and hundreds of these bamboo vipers or we call them two steps because you were dead in less than two steps and uh, so you know, not along with uh, having to explore the tunnel and you know that's their home mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so you didn't know where they would go right or left or straight or forward so you just crawling around there and, and uh, you stayed in there until uh, the mission was done. If you didn't come out, uh, another person went back in. The tunnels had to be cleared. Right. Uh, one way or another was going to catch up with you and haunt you. Right. Right. Uh, if I may, w one, one of the things that is very vivid to me to this day uh, is finding 
mainly food and medical supplies with big American flags on them. And they were provided by uh, the dissidents in America for the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And to see that, the flags on those big bags of rice and medical supplies, and stuff, it would just break your heart. And, and uh, they would proudly say that they were giving them to the North Vietnamese to fight Americans for an unjust war. And uh, to this day, I'm still very angry about that. It cost a lot of American lives. Your, our neighbors, our brothers, uh, they died because of, of those uh, supplies provided by uh, the uh, Americans who were anti-war. Uh, I'm still very angry about that to this very day. You spent a few more tours in country that we're, we're just not going to talk about, but you eventually uh, got back home, um, set up your life, um, wife, kids, a career, and years ahead, um, you found the inspiration to put together a published work um, entitled Nam Rock. Now, an important aspect of this is a relationship that you've been able to, to forge with a young man in Ohio, uh, Zeb Lane, um, you're basically your co-author. He um, was. And tell me a bit about the book and what it means to you. I met Zeb at a, a, a very large uh, car show in, in California called the Pismo Beach Classic. And uh, there's two or 300,000 people that go there and over the period of four or five days. And uh, uh, just, I'm a hot rodder. Yeah. And I had built a car uh, with the help of a friend of mine uh, and dedicated to Vietnam veterans. And they asked for that I could bring that over. And uh, would I care to give a few speeches along with this Marine they were bringing out from Ohio? Well, it turned out that that Marine was Sergeant Zeb Lane. And we spent three days together. And um, at the end of it, and uh, he, he still had what we call sand in his boots. He just hadn't been back very long. And, he was getting ready to fly out, and my wife and his wife, they had a, us in a little reserved area, which was quite an honor. Uh, my first first parade, actually. Um, and I just looked at him, and they were getting ready to take off, and I said, I'm fixing to tell you what's going to happen to you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, being a combat vet, and we talked, and all four of us ended up crying and hugging. And the last thing I said to him is I shook his hand, and I said, I want to be the guy you call at three in the morning when the enemy, we'll call them, is coming through your door ready to kill you and your wife and you have a, a loaded weapon and a bottle of whiskey in your hand. Because mm -hmm. right. I've done that. We hugged, he took off, two days later the phone rang. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we talked for four hours and he had a loaded gun and a bottle of whiskey in his hand. And unfortunately, I've been in that same situation. And so uh, he just asked me uh, during our conversations before he flew out. Uh, I've been married at that time uh, almost 40 years to a wonderful wife that has saved my life, literally made me where I can die peacefully, a happy, blessed man. Uh, and my children and, and uh, grandchildren. Uh, and he just asked me, how did, how did you get, a, he, we told war stories and we very, I very seldom tell them. And so, uh, and uh, he knew I had been there and I knew he had been there. By being there, I mean in combat, the real deal kind of guy. And he just asked me, how, how did you work? How did you become successful? How did you have a great marriage and wonderful children? And I told him, I write a lot. I write things to myself that I only want to read, and, and it's just kind of a, 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 I get things up in my head, and I'll just start writing them. And, I, he, and we start writing letters. Yeah. Yeah. And then the letters were helping him, which was my goal. Is, you know, what more of a, a calling can you have than to help one, help another person? 
That's what my grandfather always said, and expecting nothing in return but to help that person. And uh, he said, or I said, why don't we make this a book? Um, four years later, we were finished. Yeah. yeah. I wrote it all in longhand, and then um, I had some horrible wounds to his hands and arms, and had several surgeries, and then he would type it in the computer. He's a young guy who knows how to do with computers, and I put it in a kind of a book form, and uh, we had uh, some real good letters, some, some things that were happening. Uh, we even discussed a movie, uh, and the movie aspect of uh, I'm the father, he's the son, two different wars, 40 years apart. Right, right, right. Uh, and uh, then all of a sudden, uh, his PTSD got the better of him. And um, I tried with every resource I know and for the last year and a half, I have absolutely have had no contact with him. So the book that we took four years to write, and my effort was to help him, um, maybe I failed. Um, but I've never given up on anything in my life, and I will not give up on this book. Uh, he's out there. Maybe by the printing of this book, our, our interview here, right. he'll see it and go, damn, Ron never gives up. That's what you will, you're willing to stand and die for, we'll say, a total stranger. Right. Right. But he's a brother. Right. And um, uh, stand up and die with honor. That was kind of a motto of ours, one of many. And uh, to this day, I'd be willing to do that, I think. Um, a little older now, but if the cause was right, uh, I would stand up and die with honor. Right. right, and the the book itself, to transition back to that, it's going to be out very, very soon. Yes, it uh, is. Nam Rock, and it's a, it's a tremendous contribution to the body of knowledge, understanding um, America, um, so much of what makes us who we are as a country. Um, and of course, geopolitics, which yeah. has long been a huge interest of yours. Yes, I um, have. And to be able to put it down on, on paper, have that published, um, well done, sir. Oh, thank you. And, well and that's also been a little goal of mine. It didn't matter if it was about fishing or logging or whatever. It was just the idea of writing, uh, writing a book. And, and this happens to be something I'm passionate about and I'm very knowledgeable about. And, uh, here we are again in our third war, we'll say, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. And uh, we're going to end up losing, we've lost 60,000 in Vietnam and 8 to 10,000 now already in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's all political. Uh, they're going to do the same thing in Iraq and Afghanistan. As soon as we leave, they're going to start a civil war. And basically, it's going to be for naught, it's going to be for nothing but a bunch of beautiful young warriors uh, are going to be dead and forever, be it by flesh or soul, all those that enter into war are forever scarred. Um, and they will be for nothing, for absolutely nothing. You have a lot of interests and, and one that sort of uh, resonates from when you were you know, a child in Eureka, <laughs> Um, you had a bike then, well you've got a bike now, but it's a different kind of bike. Tell us about your, your interests in um, getting on the open road with your, your motorcycle and what that means to you. We had uh, little motorbikes um, up in Eureka up there. We could ride on the dirt hills and uh, some of them were homemade, some were a little Cushman. And it was just a little, a little freedom, and I, I've always been interest, interested in hot rods and motorcycles and different stages in my life. I've had different kinds of them, but uh, I average now about 20,000 miles a year and have for a long time riding. And Wow. That's uh, amazing. Yes. <laughs> uh, tracks. My mother-in-law bought me a t-shirt years ago uh, that says, you never 
see a motorcycle in front of a psychologist's office unless he owns it. Yeah. Right. And it's just, you hit the start button. I love the Sierra Mountains. Um, and all your troubles are gone. You have to concentrate, number one, mm -hmm. or you're going to end up uh, dead or very seriously injured. Um, so as soon as you hit that start button and you hear the pipes and you maybe have a planned route to go, I'd as soon head out and I'm going to take the left road. I'm going to, yeah. the little Wanda Lust thing this comes one back. Feels, yeah. This yeah. road feels good. I've never yeah. been here before. I wonder yeah. where it goes. And it's just yeah. the freedom of it. It's total relaxation. Uh, you find that all of a sudden you've ridden 150 miles and other than paying attention to what you're doing and being a safe rider, really haven't had a thought, a bad thought. And uh, you come home at the end of the day and have a cold beer and a cigar and go, ah, <laughs> man. I was just, and, and there's a brother, brotherhood of motorcycle guys too. Right, absolutely. Uh, we're there to help each other and, and, uh, and just, uh, hey, peace. You know, and just you just ride on, and um, it's something I do to this day, and I'm going to do it till I die. One thing I do need to include is that uh, the book Nam Rock, it's the working title right now, uh, is published by Sacramento Public Library's Ice Street Press. It's been a, a great half an hour. Can't thank you enough for the time. I, I appreciate that, and if I may say one more thing, the yes. the goal of the book is to help one uh, and uh, if we can help by publishing this book of uh, you folks out there that read it and it helps you or a family member all the years and pain and heart I had to bring back a lot of memories will well be worth it to to me and my co-author hopefully it can help one that's there all is, there it is uh, warriors paying forward to warriors is what it's all about so that concludes this episode of Valid of Vietnam. Uh, for Sergeant Ron Cossey, uh, Jerry Ward, our producer, India Curry, also producer, I'm James Scott. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Valley to Vietnam.